people have always wanted to buy the best they could, uh, and it used to be that the best was the best you could find locally. Now we're in contact uh, at the click of a, a, a finger with everyone in the world. And so why buy the best locally when you can buy the best in the world? And so now the connection is between those who value the highest quality products the most and those who can deliver the highest quality products from all around the world. Normally when economists think about why some people earn more than others, they look at the human capital model. So if you have more training or more experience or you're more intelligent or you're a faster runner, all those things are uh, components of your human capital. The intuitive notion is that you have twice as much, you earn twice as much as, as the next guy. But that's not the way it seems to be working out. The distribution of human capital doesn't seem to have changed in any measurable way uh, since income inequality began rising. So if you think about the music industry, in 1900, you had to listen to music in a live hall. That was the only way you could, could hear music. And so uh, everybody, of course, wanted to hear the best soprano, but there were only uh, so many music halls the best soprano could get to on the tour. And so there really was a brisk market for thousands of sopranos, and they all earned a pretty good living. Most of the music people listen to now is recorded. Once you've figured out who the best soprano is, you don't need the 10th best soprano or the 11th best soprano. A handful of sopranos can record all the major works. And then we can stamp out copies of their recordings at essentially zero marginal cost. If consumers are willing to pay only a few cents more to hear the best, uh, those singers will get the contracts and they'll earn seven-figure incomes. The, the singers who are only just slightly less talented than they are will teach music lessons to third graders. So it's a huge difference in pay, even though most listeners would have a hard time detecting differences in the quality of the voices if they were performing behind a blind screen. We decided to call these markets winner-take-all markets. Lots of people compete for a limited number of slots at the top, and the ones who land in those slots walk away with a lion's share of the total reward we tend to see vast over-entry into these markets. Way too many aspiring investment bankers, private equity managers, they, they see, people see the big paychecks and say, I want that. And what they don't see is that 99% of the people who enter those contests emerge as losers. Only a tiny handful get the big paychecks. Some 44% of Princeton seniors took jobs in the financial services industry in, in 2007. Uh, those people could have added an enormous amount of valuable, valuable service in other sectors. Uh, that's not a really good use of our, our most talented people. If there were half as many people working in that industry, the GDP wouldn't fall at all. And if those same people went to become doctors and scientists or teachers, we would see an immediate increase in the value of the, the nation's incomes. The fact that incomes have been growing so sharply at the top uh, has had a, a costly effect on the rest of the population because it's changed the, the spending patterns that define what people feel they need to get by in life. The people at the top have a lot more money. Because they do, they're building bigger houses. That's normal. That's what everyone does when they have more money. But the people just below the top, they travel in the same social circles. And so when the richest people build bigger, they feel they've got to build bigger too. And we've seen a cascade all the way down the income ladder so that now the median new house built in the United States is 50% bigger than its counterpart from 1970. Why is that? It's not because the median earner uh, is richer now than in 1970. In fact, the hourly wage of men in America in real terms is lower than it was then. Uh, it's because people like them are building bigger houses and more expensive ones. And if you don't match what people like you spend, here's the rub. Uh, your kids will go to inferior schools because the good schools are the ones located in the more expensive neighborhoods. If we want people to be able to spend in different patterns, they've, they've got to see different incentives before that's a reasonable expectation. Just scrap the current tax structure in favor one of one very much like it, in which you report your income to the IRS the same as you do now. Then you report your savings for the year. The difference between those two numbers, your income minus your savings, that's how much you spent. When you tax only consumption, you're not discouraging savings, you're encouraging savings. Savings is tax-free. You don't pay any tax on it until you take it out of your account and spend it. But then as your taxable consumption keeps rising, the rate on the next dollar you spend would go up and up and up. The higher the rate 
on the next dollar you spend, the greater the incentive to save and invest. Who is happier, uh, a rich person with a $200,000 uh, Bentley sedan uh, driving on a, a, a road riddled with potholes, or a rich person with a $150,000 BMW sedan driving on well-maintained roads? You don't get much extra when you spend that last $50,000, so they wouldn't be uh, giving up much, and it really matters what kind of road you drive your car on. So uh, all things considered, the rich would be happier in a world where there was less inequality.